Okay, I think we're ready to get started this afternoon. Uh, my name is John Moffitt. I'm with Predictix. Um, when I was 15 years old, my father told me to go get a job. I went and got a job changing light bulbs in the downtown department store. Um, and uh, that was 45 years ago, and I've been in retail ever since. And for all of you guys in the back there, the students, I would tell you that you can go try all kinds of things, but you'll never find an industry that gives you as many opportunities or is as exciting as retail. It's been a good ride for me, and I think you'll find the same. Um, I'm wearing Joseph Bank, Land's Inn, and Johnson & Murphy. Uh, I live 45 minutes from the nearest sensible brick and mortar operation, so e-commerce is very important to me, um, which is appropriate since I'm introducing uh, Doug Mack, who is CEO of One Kings Lane. Uh, One Kings Lane is, uh, is building a, a leading destination for uh, home products. Um, Doug is a veteran of the e-commerce industry, and uh, I would say that if you've not had a chance to go to onekingslane.com and take a look at what they're doing, it would be time well spent. So, Doug? All right. Uh, ever since the Oscars, I'm always worried about walking upstairs these days. <laughs> Don't want to rip my dress. Um, so, it has been awesome to sit here today and watch these presentations. Um, the quality of the speakers and the content today has been as good as I've ever seen at a conference. So first, you know, it's a huge honor to stand here as kind of the token digital guy amongst real industry titans, uh, incredible success stories and great leaders. So I want to start off with a little bit of a shout out to the conference organizers for having put together such a great agenda. <laughs> it's really... um, I found it even interesting that as we went through 30 slides of macroeconomic data, it was riveting. It was, I'd, and I, it wasn't like that when I was in college. I just hoped to show up to that class. Um, it's like, wow, people are driving less because of e-commerce. That's pretty amazing. Um, so in any event, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about One Kings Lane. Um, we're a leading destination for the home. And our special sauce is every single day we marry inspiration, advice, and design expertise with fresh, new, unique home products designer products, vintage products that you can't find anywhere else. And that's been a really magical formula for growing the business. Um, so what I'm gonna take you through today is just a bit of our journey in building the business as a digital disruptor uh, to talk about what it's like to build a digital business, what it takes to build a digital brand. Um, you know, by the way, one of the most exciting things I heard Today's content is that Costco is not going in the home business. Um, <laughs> my heart was beating when that question was asked. I'm like, please, no, don't expand. Um, leave it open. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about as a pure play building, building out uh, a great home business. So first, um, it was actually really interesting looking at slide by slide of Costco of doing something new every year. That's exactly how we think about our businesses over the last four years, coming up with new things to surprise and delight our customers to keep them coming back. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the home market. In retail, this has always been a big industry, but no one's really cracked it, and a lot of people stray away from it, or it's a portion of what they do. It's the entirety of what we do. So I want to talk a little bit about why we love the home market, and then get into what has been the core to building a great digital business, what we see as our differentiators. Um, spend a little bit of time on talent as people think about scaling digital operations. Uh, Building online businesses requires a different talent set than a traditional retail company, and I'll share with you some of the backgrounds in our company. And then finally, to kind of step away from One King's Lane and think more about my last 10 or so years in the e-commerce industry, what are some thoughts and trends on building a brand in the, in the digital era? Um, and I know that we've got a lot of students in the room, so if you want to tweet anything I share out today, it's at Doug Mack or at One King's Lane, so feel free to share anything if you like it. If you do not like it, I would prefer you post to MySpace instead of Twitter. <laughs> so um, a little bit on um, history of innovation. So we were founded in 2009 by Ali Pincus and Susan Feldman, two great entrepreneurs who saw a void in the home industry to get great, unique, interesting product in the hand of consumers. 
And they really were the first to launch the flash sales model, which you may be familiar with um, in the home industry. And th there started the innovation to say, take a business model that's working in other categories like apparel and accessories, bring it to home and let's see what we have. Uh, they went out and they raised some money from Kleiner Perkins. Um, I joined them very early on. Uh, and now it's the third partner to One Kings Lane to join as their CEO. Uh, 29 employees, a million dollars a month of revenue and, and champagne dreams uh, and a beer budget. Um, and we had to try to build a great business. And so in early 2010, I came in and said, hey, this flash sales thing is kind of interesting, but I don't want that to be the definition of our business. There's some things that are good about flash sales. There's other things that aren't great. Um, artificial urgency, selling overstock products, and a few other things. So I just said, let's run up and become the number one destination for the home um, in the digital world. And that can be a component of what we're doing. So there and started more innovation. In 2010, we introduced our designer tag sales. Uh, just to give me a sense, how many One Kings Lane members in the room? Pretty good, pretty much all women. 96% uh, of our customers are women. Um, so very female-oriented business. So I'll tell you just a little bit about the history but not spend too much time. Tag sales are basically the concept of there's all this great merchandise in the hands of interior designers out in their warehouses, they're working with clients. And for the first time, somebody gave the everyday consumer a peek into the, the world of elite interior design that you could actually buy interior design to the trade level product at a price that was attainable and you didn't need to work through a designer to get it. Uh, really exciting innovation, 2010. 2011 was a big year. We started the business all outsourced. We basically insourced everything that mattered, technology, uh, email marketing, customer service, operations, et cetera. But really, really importantly, this was the year we made the commitment to world-class creative. If you're going to be selling in a digital-only forum, the only voice you have is that screen, that iPad, that mobile device. And so what we did is we bought a leading design agency in Manhattan called Helicopter, who was doing work for Nike and uh, Water, Waterworks and um, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and basically said, come in and make us the best creative company in commerce. So we brought them in, and that's been a huge part of our, our mission. And I'll talk a little bit to where that's evolved to later. And then finally, last year, 2012, we launched the first curated marketplace on the web. And what that basically means is um, the first marketplace where not just anyone could sell. Historical online marketplaces, the only barrier to listing a product was if you're willing to pay the listing fee. Uh, in our marketplace, the barrier to listing a product is we have category experts by vertical who vet the sellers and vet their products and say they're worthy of our brand living behind them. And that was a huge innovation for the industry as well. You're beginning to hear this concept of curated marketplaces more and more now. So um, last year was our third year. We passed 200 million in revenue. It was 100% year over year growth. Uh, capitalized the business very well. One of the most exciting things is Scripps Networks, the parent company of HGTV, became a strategic investor in the company last year. We're big believers in the power of two screen commerce, broadcast meets mobile. So that's one slide on, on our short history. Um, why we love the home market. So huge market, $158 billion is spent in the US every year on home decor, and this does not include the Home Depot categories. The, the, this is furniture, textiles, kitchenware, decorative accessories, very, very big industry. If you scale that globally, it's a half a trillion dollars. So this is one of the biggest industries out there. It's just insanely fragmented. There aren't any Costco's in this industry, and thank Lord there doesn't appear to be one coming. Um, <laughs> And that provides opportunity for new entrants. You know, in our industry last year, 10% of US e-commerce uh, for home decor, 10% of sales in home decor was done via e-commerce last year. So it's getting there. Companies like ours are helping grow online consumption of home decor. Uh, 2015, it's projected to be about 15% of all home decor sales. So we're really excited that there's this tailwind at our back as we're building a great, the best digital brand for home decor that consumers, as they prefer to shop more and more online versus offline, uh, will begin to shop with us. Other things that are always important about the industry is the, kind of the classic quarters model. Where's the power in the industry? Manufacturer brands and home are not very well known, typically. Um, if I put up our top 20 selling brands, I would guess the average person in this room would actually know maybe two, three, four, if you're a real enthusiast. Um, the other thing is extreme fragmentation of the retail channel. Uh, there are big retailers like Pottery Barn, 
crate and barrel and whatnot, but when you add up the 158 billion, you very quickly get to the long tail of dealers, boutique shops, and the like. And so we really saw a huge wide open e-commerce opportunity and probably the most common question that I get about One King's Lane is, do you plan to go into other categories? And not, not in any meaningful way, because it's a big industry that needs a really great digital solution. Um, the other thing that I find interesting about the industry is, are the low service expectations, where you can go into a store, you can order some home furnishings, you can be quoted a 14-week delivery time. 14 weeks pass, you don't hear anything about it being scheduled or whatnot and then you find out you're gonna get it in week 18 and it happens to fall you know, the weekend after Thanksgiving when you'd really hoped you were gonna get it. And I see some nods, everyone's kind of lived through this. So the bar on service has been set pretty low for us to jump over. All right, addressing a major void in the home market. So every new startup that succeeds starts with going after an unmet customer need. And the unmet customer need we talk about all the time is this gap between the high end and the mass market. And at the high end, you have interior design, which is amazing. You get great service, great advice. You get pushed out of your comfort zone. You get this beautiful home that you cherish coming home to each night. But not everybody can access interior design. Not everybody can afford interior design. Some people are intimidated by interior design. Others want to have a little bit of pride of doing it on their own a bit, like the crafting industry. I want to participate in the design. And so if you're, if you're not on the design end of the spectrum, you're in mass market, which you're walking into the traditional specialty retailers where the business model is having the least number of SKUs I can sell to the most number of people. And that creates these cookie cutter catalog looks that you could walk into a friend's home and frankly have a very similar feel, uh, not feel unique, personal, or special in, in one of the most important places in your life, your home. So we're stepping into the middle and saying, hey, what if you could get that personal, unique experience that you walk into your home and it's a full reflection of your personality but do it at a, in a process and at a price point that you can afford to make it happen. And that's the unmet need that we've been going after. But to do that, we've needed to do two really big things. One is to help inspire our customers. Um, if you go into retail, you, you see a scene and you get to visualize what a living room or whatnot might look like. It might not be that personal to you. What we do is every single day we come up with design stories. Uh, and I'll share some of those to you a little bit that help consumers who don't know much about home decor to have a reason to come every day. It may be to learn about color, about putting things together, about how to make over a room, and to just get ideas on how could they make their home the home that they've always wanted. But didn't that make that actionable that you can buy the look, buy what you see? Uh, on the other end is access, which is there are literally hundreds of thousands of home de decor products one could wade through, and our team's core competency is curation going through and finding the best of the best, bringing back unique, interesting product that you probably would not be able to find on your own. So marrying inspiration with access to product has been key to building a digital brand and a digital business. And then it was mentioned in a few of the discussions today, I do believe value, uh, you have to value. When I first started with the company, we had a very heavy value message in terms of discount message. We pull back significantly from that. If I do think you should get paid for the work that you do, you just have to find that magical point of, of where, where you deliver the right amount of value. So to talk a little bit more detail about that inspiration, our team thinks about every day, how do we have an editorial point of view that meets commerce to drive action? And so a couple examples from our homepage. Um, in the winter, we ran a day called the Winter Palette, where we basically said, here's a palette to see how you could build the perfect bed in a winter look. Uh, here's a way to cozy up your living room, uh, to, to warm it up a little bit. And then if you like these design stories, you could go ahead and buy them. If you don't like today's design story, come back tomorrow, because there'll be another story that may connect with your interest and with your taste. Another thing we ran was an art fair. Basically, wine and art fairs happen across the country many weekends of the year. Uh, why not do that online where you could wander in and see a great photographic print for $200 alongside a Renoir for $50,000? Find your range in between that you'd find interesting. Um, and what this is to me really disrupting is a disconnected editorial and commerce model in the home industry right now, where home is a considered purchase, it's often a big purchase, where you may get a shelter magazine at home, you get it once a month, it sits on your coffee table, you get super excited about the looks and the ideas, and you have no ability to act on it. It sits on the coffee table and you cannot have that look. And then maybe you walk into a retail chain like Restoration Hardware that has great stuff, 
uh, but it in no way connects to the editorial advice. So the dots are not connected currently. And more so if you don't like the assortment, they happen to have this quarter. It's not gonna change anytime soon. You're gonna have to wait for a new season of the year to go see what they might have next. So we're really looking to totally change the consumer mindset, almost turning the home business into a fashion business, of thinking about change dynamic, very personal. Give you a little bit more sense of getting into utility advice. Um, this was a recent thing we did called Ottoman Empire that we talked to people about how to use Ottomans in their home. 264 SKUs, multiple vendors, multiple styles, and basically said most people think of Ottomans as something that put your feet up on. But have you ever thought about maybe in the bedroom getting a bench Ottoman and putting it at the, the end of the bed? Uh, personally, my wife hates that because then I throw my clothes on the bench Ottoman rather than hanging them up, but it's a good look and a lifestyle shot. Um, in the family room, another thought, Ottomans can actually be additional seating around a coffee table, or maybe even in the living room, let's say you have little ones and you don't want them to scar themselves on the edge of a sharp coffee table, you can actually get a soft edge Ottoman as your coffee table and it can hold product. So many times a day, literally thousands of times a day, somebody comes into One King's Lane not actually knowing what they're going to buy and actually not needing an Ottoman, and then they walk out that day and say, you know what, you've inspired me, this is really cool, I want my home to look like this. And this is what our team strives to do every single day, is to basically provide that interior design advice at scale, that editorial point of view at scale, that is so easy to take action on and have that in your home. And we're totally okay if you don't like today's story. Come back tomorrow, come back the next day, find that story you love and make it, make it personal and make it your own. The perhaps most important thing in building a digital business, and probably a lot of this extrapolates to retail in general in this day and age is unique product. And a metric that we track is what percent of revenues come from unique product on an ongoing basis. And in Q4, 98% of our revenues were generated from unique product. So by unique product, I mean literally from vendors that no consumer would know. You'd have to walk into a great boutique store in Westport, Connecticut, turn over the silver accessory and you still wouldn't know the name of that thing or remember it, but you just love the accessory. It could be these thematic events like Ottoman Empire where we put a bunch of product in, not about the brands, it's about the theme. It can be about our vintage marketplace where you're seeing goods from antique dealers, art boutiques and the like, that they're literally one of a kind item. You're gonna get it, nobody else is. This tag sale concepts where we work with leading celebrities, designers where they curate events together. And then you get into the rare cases, occasionally we'll run a Cuisinart. You know, those are not exciting days for me on many levels because I know people can go find Cuisinarts elsewhere and then it's not about the editorial and the inspiration but it's about the price delivery and shipping which makes us less special on that day. Um, then there's enthusiast brands which you typically can't find online like Frette or Stark. So this is a super, super important concept. Um, I feel that if you're a digital only player and you're playing heavily in the yellow slice, you know, if it's something that has a UPC code on it, you know, Amazon's gonna crush you. Um, they're gonna ship it faster, they're going to make it cheaper, they're gonna be friendlier about returns, you name it. They are the supply chain company, they are the search engine. And so, super important. Um, talking about brands, it just reminded me, I didn't share what I'm wearing today, is that a mandatory thing? So um, I, I'm in a Brooks Brothers 1818 blazer. I've got a Thomas Mason shirt from uh, the liquor store. So unfortunately, Mickey Drexler is not here. I shopped his singular store. Uh, then I've got polo boxers on. <laughs> TMI? TMI? All right, put that one on MySpace. <laughs> the other thing about building a great digital brand and business is mobile and mobility. Um, one of the key reasons I joined Susan and Allie on this mission is I, I had this brewing feeling from time in e-commerce that mobile would be a fourth wave of retail onto itself. That the first wave were stores, second mail order catalogs, third e-commerce through the web and multi-channel, fourth mobility. Um, and that hypothesis has proven true. Um, if I put our execution behind mobile strategy over the last three years on a grading scale, I'd give us a B, B minus. Um, it's 28% of our revenues. So we haven't even fully executed the heck out of this opportunity and it makes me pretty exciting, excited. 
And I think there's a few things. Not all businesses are created equal when it comes to mobile. If you have a dynamic business, if you have unique product, if you have storytelling, um, if you have great images, these are all things that are great for the mobile world. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're commodity products, text heavy, not changing very often, there is no real urgency to come to check you out on mobile. And also think about a couple types of mobility. There's mobility outside the home. You're in the line at Starbucks, you have four minutes, you're loyal to a brand like One Kings Lane, what's going on One Kings Lane today? I may find something, I may buy it. There's also mobility in the home that we see, that you're home at night with a spouse, fellow decision maker, uh, maybe a higher ticket purchase we typically see, and you're taking your iPad into the room that you're making a decision about mobility in the home. So there's a couple of uh, big vectors there. Uh, what I've said to my team incessantly and all my friends in the e-commerce industry is no matter how much we're spending on mobile right now, we're still not spending enough. This is such a massive opportunity to, to completely change the customer experience. Um, and I didn't even get into things like the showcasing scenarios. So I was on, when Terry did his poll earlier, I was on the tiny bar up top that like eight of us voted for mobile. Like put me down for mobile. All right, we're together. <laughs> mobile. All right. Um, building a digital brand authentic commitment to the customer. So this hasn't changed. You will never build a great brand in any form of the consumer market without customer service focus. All the more important in the digital world where the touch points with your, your company are much more limited. The only voice they ever hear are the people that they call on our customer service team. That's why our customer service team is in the heart of San Francisco, sitting by other folks college educated, typically off the floor of retail, because that's the voice of OKL when our customers call us. Um, would never outsource that type of customer experience offshore to an unempowered team. What this is related to, and that's just one example, the whole company has to be aligned behind it. Um, from day one, 80% of revenues in any given month are from our current customers coming back and buying again. So even when you're growing a business at the rate we have, 100% year over year, it's actually not about going out and spending a lot on marketing and bringing a lot of new people in. It's about existing customers coming back and loving what you're providing with the new customers coming in and beginning to fill in those ranks as well. Uh, customer service survey, um, in a business like ours where we have 2,000 new products on the site every day, this is a huge challenge to have things like knowledge about products at this rate of speed. Everything we're doing now is in the 90s and above. You're never done on this until it's up at 98, 99%. Um, the most exciting metric that we look at is what percent of our customers aren't only customers, but brand promoters. And in this case, 63% uh, of our shoppers are brand promoters, meaning we ask them on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about the following statement? I am very likely to recommend One King's Lane to a friend. And 63% of them rate us an eight, nine, or 10 on that metric, which is a great way from the world of mouth cycle to, to build the business. So uh, when you think about our editorial point of view, our unique product, our mobile growth, right alongside that in building a digital brand is an authentic customer service experience. That translates into other, all this translates into other great brands wanting to be associated with your brand. We've had a great run over the last few years as a small business, ranging from celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow, Courtney Cox, Dennis Hopper, uh, Diane Keaton, who all have a deep interest in the home industry and have come in and done work with us uh, to put together sales events. Uh, great designers like Albert Hadley, who passed away last year, Kelly Wurstler, Michael Smith, who's the designer for the Obamas, to come in and put events together with us. Um, Martha Stewart, you know, no bigger name in home, um, doing some stuff together there as well. And then Scripps Network. When Scripps um, with HGTV, DIY, Food Network and the like decided that they were interested in the e-commerce industry, they went out and they kicked the tires with probably 10 companies and they basically came back to us and said, we want to invest in you because you're the company that we believe in your brand and we want our brand to be associated with. And that was a huge, exciting moment and you're gonna see a lot of collaboration out of us and HGTV to put the One Kings Lane brand on a much bigger stage over the next few years. All right, so I hope the students know this. Do you know what a BHAG is? You're not teaching Jim Collins at this university. <laughs> Jim Collins built uh, uh, good to great, built to last, big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, 
It's a concept that early days of the company, don't be incremental, put some goals out that are so big that you don't know how you're gonna achieve them, but they're gonna keep you from being incremental and stretch your thinking. So what we did a couple years ago, when we were very small in terms of the amount of traffic we had, is we put together a goal to say, let's become the number one most visited premium home site in the US. And that was pretty daunting when up against brands like Crate and Barrel who have been around for 50 years and we'd only been around for one. Um, we're the solid green line. We've passed by everybody at this point. We're just about to catch Pottery Barn and the BHAG. And that's gonna be exciting. So this year we will flip over and be the most visited uh, premium site among all the premium incumbents. Um, and what's very interesting about this data, if anyone's thinking about doing a startup, most of this tracking data in the industry isn't great because it does not track mobile. So when we actually look at our traffic, it says we have four million visits a month. That probably understates our traffic by about 50% right now because it's not tracking mobile visitors, which is pretty remarkable. So I'm in search of the tracking service who actually thinks mobile is worth tracking. All right, chapter four, moving on to what it takes to build a new digital brand and digital business. Um, very, very different talent profile. And so when we look at our business, you might think, hey, packed up with a bunch of e-commerce nerds. And that's true. We've got a lot of great e-commerce expertise in the company. Um, our head of marketing, our CMO, was the VP of marketing for eBay. He hired in uh, the head of marketing out of Zappos to run our internet marketing team. Um, we hired the head of HR out of Quidzy, which is part of Amazon, to come in and run HR. So have kind of filled in that e-commerce quadrant, but most importantly is having a balanced set of skills in the company. Um, retail skills, our merchants coming from best of the best, J. Crew, Pottery Barn, Limited, Sonoma, Ralph, um, because it is really all about the merch. If the merch isn't right, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, none of the rest of it matters. Then when you think about these design stories that we create every day, we need great editorial expertise, and the editorial, the media industry is going through massive disruption right now, so there's great talent available to work on next generation business models. So we've hired people, uh, the original Domino team, for those that know Domino Magazine, we, we've reunited some of the members of the, that band, uh, which was a publication that was loved but shut down by Condé Nast, Martha Stewart Living, Al Decor, had a photography used to do that for Architectural Digest. And then technology, my background's a real hybrid, but I've spent a lot of time in technology. That's a big component of our business, of building a great technology or that can build technology, applications, data infrastructures to support a new age business. And so uh, not for the faint of heart to build a purely digital business because it requires putting together such a eclectic mix of skills that you may not see in a traditional retail business. And also I spend a lot of my time, I was actually just talking to a friend about this earlier, um, trying to get the art and the science side of the business really teaming together to maximize the potential of the company. All right, I'm gonna scroll ahead to the, to the end. Um, no more about One King's Lane and more about just my thoughts on building a brand in the digital era. Um, so we had our four year anniversary a few weeks ago on uh, March 29th, and I was trying to think about what to say to the team. We have a lot of millennials in our team, so people like are excited about what we've done but don't have context on how fast is fast. And I was like, let's kind of get some context on what we've accomplished in four years. I hear some chuckles. Others are managing millennials in the room right now, clearly. Um, let's talk. Um, so, um, looked up some history of great brands like Starbucks. Or like Starbucks, founded in, uh, 1971 by two men, and by 1994, 23 years later, they passed 250 million in revenue. Um, so 23 years for that brand, which is probably peppered throughout this room right now to keep you adequately caffeinated to get through the home stretch here. Um, 23 years to build that brand to the level of relevance, quarter of a billion in revenue. Now a $13 billion household name. You know, Nike, founded in 1964, two men passionate about running, uh, it took them till 1980, or 16 years, uh, to get to 250 million in revenue as a benchmark. And then now, obviously, they're a $24 billion retailer, probably amongst the top three or four most valued brands on the planet. Um, and you know, from our point of view, we've already now, this year, passed that run rate on revenue uh, four years in. So in the digital era, you can build a brand so much faster. If you don't execute, you can also destroy a brand much faster, too. It cuts both ways. It's a very efficient market. Um, I also put up Zappos because it's kind of interesting. If I think we're actually in a second wave of digital, where Zappos was born in 1999, 
the first wave of e-commerce. And by 2003, their four-year anniversary, they're a $70 million business. And so the world has changed a lot, even in the last 10 years of digital, in terms of consumer readiness, device penetration, social sharing, uh, all the types of technology and infrastructure to scale a digital business. So um, one thing I'm constantly reminded of, I've started in e-commerce in 1997, is I pretty much try to forget everything I learned before 2005 because it's probably worth trying again. If it didn't work in 2003, it's probably because it was 2003, not because it wasn't a viable idea. Um, so that's a little bit about the context, and I think this was good for our team to say, okay, been a pretty good four years. There's a potentially bright future ahead. So five trends for the digital ever, era, I think. Um, some trends I feel very passionately about. Uh, number one is you have to have superior merchandise. The difference between a great day, a good day, and a bad day on One King's Lane is directly correlated to the quality of the merchandise we launched that day, period. Site crashes notwithstanding, but um, largely around merchandise. And having a phenomenal merchandising strategy as a digital business is as important as it's always been for any retail business. There's nothing about social, mobile, marketing strategies that will overcome lack of a great merchandising strategy. Genuine commitment to service. It's a more efficient market than ever when it comes to information. And companies that provide poor service are outed on the internet like crazy. Brand damage go into the death spiral and vice versa. Great service. When I talked about that net promoter score that we measure as a company, it's because we want to know how our customers feel about us because what are they out saying? And then C, it's one thing that very interesting um, that I put up that seems a little wonky, but still has to be really fast. So there are, uh, people are not patient when it comes to digital shopping experiences. And as you move to the iPad or new Android devices, these are very beefy computers, but they're still not as beefy as desktop experiences. Delayed page loads, delayed image loads, lots of rich media that slows down the experience, all these things can actually cut against your growth. And so uh, in building a digital business and brand, merch service blazing fast is kind of the foundation of the pyramid. Uh, and a couple of these things are zero change from the skills that reta great retailers have had in the past. Uh, number two is, I think, first movers and new commerce and new ideas have great leverage. We live this every day. Um, it's very hard. I loved when Jim earlier said, be a moving target. Um, we feel that way of, if you rest on your laurels of an initial concept, there is such a flood of other people who will try to take it and copy it and imitate. Um, that you're not gonna be around very long. But if you're a first mover who does something great first, you build around and you continue to have a stream of firsts and build this brand with soul around a vertical the way we have uh, in home, there's a huge opportunity. But I've seen, particularly I'm Silicon Valley based, our company split between San Francisco, New York, and LA. Um, I see in Silicon Valley all the time the notion of lots of capital, lots of talent going in and chasing an idea that already exists. Or I see traditional retailers launch something that's kind of half to bake on their site that's imitation of an existing model of a pure play company. I think all those things are going to die off. Um, consumers are really smart. Everything is one click away. Things that are executed at a very high level are going to win. So um, I think a lot about our team is what percent of what we are doing is something that we're doing first that nobody else is doing. And that's, to me, been so core to building a digital business and brand. Number three is I think focus is super important. Um, I think from the Iconics presentation, we heard about the notion of the rifle shot, the Macy's and the Costco. Um, and I'm talking about vertical focus. Um, there are lots of new commerce companies being built, and there's basically a bit of a, a religious battle between horizontal and vertical. Uh, my sense is there was an era back in the early 1900s that you could build a Macy's as a multi-category player and it could grow up over time, or an Amazon in 1993, who they even began very focused and struggled initially until Prime came along to become a successful horizontal play. Now, with how pervasive consumer behavior is in e-commerce, the efficiency of the dialogue, the notion of picking something specific that your brand stands for and being the best in the digital world around it I think is a critical trend to building a great company. Um, the other part is, I'm not talking no expansion. You can thoughtfully expand. Can a business like ours go out of the US internationally? Absolutely. But only at the point that you feel your unit economics are at the point that it could sustain that kind of growth strategy. And then you build a, a built-to-last company. 
Number four, lots for those that read the, the tech blogs and magazines, massive hype around local, social, mobile. And I do think those are important trends, uh, but not necessarily in that order. Um, local is the one that, as I think about my business and the business that my friends in retail and e-commerce are in, is very specifically a applicable in certain scenarios, but generally not something that's gonna be a game changer for a business like ours. Um, social, super important, ambiguous thing, a lot of talk about that. I don't know a lot of people that have had this very successful, pure social Facebook strategy. I know a lot of money has gone into it. Um, and I also see it as a bit of a mantra that people wrap themselves in a newcomer say, hey, we're a social commerce company. I don't really know what that means. Um, the social sites are great platforms for marketing, incredibly hyper-targeted marketing to reach customers that you want to come into your business or you want to retarget to come back into your business. And social like Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook can be an ingredient in the soup. It can be per, you know, percentage points contribution to free traffic, but it doesn't mean that these businesses will suddenly grow up and to the right and have no more marketing costs. I think there's been a bit of an insinuation of that. Um, we, we do a robust amount of marketing every day to support the growth that we've had as a business. But mobile's the one. I, I think that of this kind of basket, not saying don't pay attention to social just as an ingredient in your strategy. Uh, for me, when you look at mobile, I still, in baseball terms, feel like we're in the first inning. That when you look at what happened so far, what mobile's done is there's a lot of people who could shop e-commerce basically who had a laptop or a desktop Mobile is now creating a massive amount of penetration of devices in the hands of many, many more people, and that trend will not stop. The sophistication of those devices will only get better. That will not stop. The bandwidth to that device, man, going from 3G to 4G, it's amazing. That evolution will not stop. The quality of the applications and experience that we as retailers and digital companies develop to make that experience incremental and better than some of their other shopping experiences, that won't stop either. And so I think it'll be fascinating to scroll ahead five years from now and say, I showed you the line of our chart of by March, 28% of our revenue um, is from mobile. With what we have planned for the next year in mobile, I would not be shocked that a year from now if we're, we're mobile first, if we're more mobile than desktop. And if we're taking advantage of basically the whole world being somebody's inspiration landscape for home decor, anywhere they go at any time that they see something they're excited about, that becomes an inspiration moment to think about shopping one King's Lane. Um, pretty amazing opportunity and an exciting thing for retail. Last but not least is winners will learn to harness the power of big data. Uh, we think about this all the time. And this is... Um, in, in Terry's presentation this morning, he just talked about a very specific example of that of universal uh, visibility of inventory across all channels so that the customer who wants a product in the moment is gonna get fulfilled. I'd say that's like a base level big data scenario. I'm beginning to think about things such as customer intimacy. Um, as a digital business, 100% of our customers log into our site no matter what device they're on. And that gives us an opportunity to gather lots and lots of data about what people are interested in, in individual and in aggregate. And so, so much of the future is gonna be about marketing relevance. Where you're, how are you using this information? Are you using it as a service? Where the thing that you put in front of the customer is well-timed, it's relevant to them, and it's in a moment of need, that becomes almost a personal shopping experience. And only with big data strategies behind the, the use and the deployment of that data in a way with a service mentality will that happen. Sourcing intelligence, you know, can we turn retail from a push model to a, a pull model where customers uh, do walk into stores often anonymously, they look at things, we don't track what they're doing, so there's not much information going on there. In a digital world, the notion of there's all this latent demand of people coming to a site like One King's Lane every day where they're like, boy, silver accessories under $100 are red hot, but you just don't have enough of them and you're leaving all this money on the table, go get more of that. Um, huge opportunity to, to access what customers are interested in who are coming through your digital doors and leaving footprints behind. Customer-specific shopping experiences. This, this is um, the notion of when you visit a site, the advantage of the digital world or the physical world is everybody can have their own store. Um, we may not need to get there overnight, but eventually a site, uh, one of my favorite sites of all time, Pandora, love it. Um, it's because every time I visit it, the next time I go, the site's even better. 
because it's learned something about me that's put a song in, taken a song out, exposed a new song that I might be interested in. Retail can have that same kind of dynamic with big data. And then last but not least is service differentiation. Um, not all customers are created equal. We're already putting a big investment in this at One Kings Lane where we use predictive analytics in our data warehouse to determine what we think the long-term value of a customer will be in a very short period into their life cycle based off of how often do they come to the site, what do they look at, what do they buy, what do they abandon. And then when somebody calls into our customer service team, you know, some customer service policies are meant to be broken. Um, if somebody's gonna be a really high value shopper over a long period of time, it's time to step up and do something extra nice for that customer. And so big data is an absolutely huge opportunity that in a, in a world that's increasingly gonna shift digital, um, to take advantage of that information to provide a fundamentally biz better business model for customers. So that's it. Those are my thoughts on building a brand in a digital era and a, a business. If we've got time, happy to take a couple questions. Didn't want you to be alone, Doug, uh, up there with no questions. So do you, because you think that mobile is going to be so important, do you distinguish today between smartphone versus tablet? And do you analyze it any differently or try to merge differently? Yeah, um, massively. And we go even further than that. We basically look at a grid that we say there's smartphone and tablet. And within smartphone and tablet, there's web optimized experience then there's app experiences. And we look at that grid and basically, so actually we go even further, we go smartphone optimized web, tablet optimized web, smartphone apps, tablet apps, Apple, not Apple. And go through that entire grid to basically say in each of these platform situations, what's the experience that you want to provide to the customer that takes most advantage of that, that aspect? So apps are way faster than mobile optimized web. So mobile optimized web may be more about solving that performance nut. It may be more about minimum marketable feature sets, stripping back and unplugging, where app is your most loyal shopper who's gonna come in, be willing to download, and may want a more robust, elegant, lean back experience. And so um, that's back to, you know, ties back to my thought of however much we're investing in mobile, it's not enough. A lot of people are like, is it app or is it mobile optimized web? Is it Apple or is it Android? I'm kind of like, this is not the place to be making those prioritization trade-offs because ultimately for many businesses, it'll be such a dominant opportunity to grow or fail that you actually need to have skills to be great at all of those very early on. Uh, it was a great presentation. I think I uh, fully agree with you that um, I was also, I think, one of the eight people who voted for mobile. But all right. um, one question I had was when you showed the numbers 23% uh, for mobile, what was the breakdown between tablets and the handset if you were, if you attracted? it? Because um, being in mobile ourselves, we are finding that there's some resistance for users to log in and do transactions as compared to like doing it on the desktop. Yep, so what we're finding is in that it's 28% of revenue from mobile, it's about 60% tablet, about 40% smartphone, then what we're finding is that tablet customers are actually typically higher average order value, longer linger time duration. Smartphone are much more snacking, lower average value, high conversion, shorter time. And so these back to Angela's question a little bit, like these are very different scenarios to think about solving for. One of the things we very much think about solving for is what's the user mindset, the customer mindset when they're, they're using the device. And we very much think of smartphone as an on the go you know, you're sitting in a board meeting at work, you're at Starbucks, you're sitting in this presentation, you're using your smartphone. Tablet, uh, you know, in bed at night, magazine replacement, more time, more uh, looking for more emotional engagement, uh, something that's more entertaining. And so I've actually been surprised that smartphones been as high a per percentage from a revenue perspective. A lot of it has to do with penetration of smartphone. That iPhone came out and just, you know, changed the world of smartphones. Android has quickly fall, fallen behind, followed behind with great devices. It's just a law of big numbers of there's just way more smartphones and tablets out there, but the tablet growth at the same age of maturity is actually faster than smartphone was. So these are two platforms to be reckoned with with very different uh, strategic implications for what you might do in each.
Thank you. I, I wonder if you'd be able to elaborate on your comment about how we switch from a push model to a pull model. Uh, that's, um, I guess, easy to say, hard to do. Do you have any ideas about maybe some of the initial steps that will make that a reality? Yeah, so it's a great question. And it, to kind of restate the concept in general, there's a certain amount of art that happens in retail that you have planning, you look back at history, but at many times it's about retail asserting trends. You know, you may be a home furnishing retailer and say, this spring is gonna be all about teal and let's get our throws and our home furnishings and our decorative accessories oriented around this color theme and you make a bet. And that bet may or may not work with your customers and you may or may not be stuck with excess inventory markdowns and you then may have to think of a new bet. So that's a little bit about the notion of push retail of you have a certain amount of imperfect data that you're trying to forecast or create trends that may or may not hit the mark. When I think about pull retail in our business, it's more about as our customers come in and we're putting different products in front of them and um, we have more than knowing whether they bought or not to rely on. We may know um, how many people looked at a product, how many people put it in a shopping cart, um, how much time did people spend lingering with certain products. That and so you go beyond the notion of sales data as the guide and it's more about behavioral data where somebody can spend time um, with products and not necessarily buy them, but in aggregate, when you have millions, you know, in our case, six, seven million people coming in a month, they're giving us cues to say there are certain categories, certain styles, certain price points that when we put them up, generate a lot of heat around them, and therefore our team should go out and find more product around that because those customers are pulling them through the system. And so, you know, one of the things, uh, applications I think about for traditional retail sometimes is the notion of rocket testing, of can you get a certain number of products in small run, get them up on the site, and begin to gather some of that behavioral data before you go too long in something that might be speculative. So that would be my recommendation of how you might ease your way into thing of, if you feel you're going on something that's way too much gut and not enough science behind it, and you don't wanna put a big bet on it yet, how do you get like the quickest possible opportunity to put that up in a sample mode, see not just the sales data, but the heat around that product or product line, and then make your bet to go long in inventory. And I think that's a really exciting evolution. The one thing I didn't talk at all about today is, we at One Kings Lane provide a luxury retail experience on the front end when you shop the site. On the back end, we're more of a marketplace. We don't take a lot of inventory risk. Uh, we, we as a business at any given time have less than $10 million of inventory. So we don't even measure inventory turns. It's, it's not even a metric we look at. All right, that's the hook. Thanks everyone.